as indicated, uh, I'm now a, a professor of law and I'm the associate head of the law school at Lancaster. But uh, what I'm talking about here happened about such 20 miles down the road where I was for uh, 20 odd years at Preston at UCLan. So this is Lancashire Law School, uh, where I was essentially I was, I was head of teaching, uh, teaching and learning uh, in the law school for the sort of 10 or 12 years before uh, I moved up here to Lancaster. Um, my design journey started, I, I became interested in sort of different ways of communicating legal education, legal information, um, in particular with my students, things like um, mapping and so forth. Um, but through that interesting kind of legal visualization, I came across this field of uh, legal design, where there were people, uh, in particular in uh, Northern Europe and Helsinki, who were using uh, visualization and design techniques to make um, business contracts less impenetrable and more useful for the people who commission those. Um, and the big movement in the States with the uh, law labs was using uh, visualization and design techniques on access to justice issues. And this particular picture here, this vendor power, I just read about this and thought that's exactly what I want to do. So it's the Center for Urban Pedagogy New York City. Uh, they work with artists, uh, designers and community groups uh, to communicate rights and responsibilities. So this was street vendors, it's a very complex legal code regulating street vendors in New York. Lots and lots of infractions. So they did a design process in relation to it and created this poster, this kind of fold out uh, sheet, very visual, reduced text, multilingual, we placed it in the hands of the people who were regulated by this law. And I thought, that's exactly what I want to do. So this, uh, this picture shows a project that I did with a graphic design undergraduate at Preston. We did the same kind of process in relation to students as tenants in private housing. Uh, so we identified the main problems. Uh, we looked at the legal regulation that uh, we simplified it, made it more visual and produced, uh, and produced a, a, a kind of fold out poster. And that's what most legal designers do. They, they look outside of the walls of the, the law school for um, legal problems, whether it's in contracts or court processes, and apply design thinking to that. But to bring it back to the original picture, it occurred to me that, you know, first and foremost, as a legal designer, I'm an, I'm an educator. And I didn't have to look outside of the walls of the building in which I work to find problems and challenges that was suitable for design approaches. So the, the particular project uh, that we uh, applied that to was a curriculum redevelopment. So the, the entire law degree was being re restructured, a new structure that meant there were fewer and bigger new one modules. And essentially we've had about 12 months between the sign off of that structure and delivery. Um, and we decided to be ambitious and throw ourselves in, in, in design mode to address some of the key challenges. And those were to have a more con connected curriculum. So a lot of higher education is very siloed and very fragmented. That teachers think about a program from the perspective of what they contribute to it, but that's not the student perspective. Students see, see whole programs and want to see uh, connections uh, between different parts of the program. Law can be taught in a pretty abstract way as a uh, sort of pristine code of ideal rules, but law, in reality, is a very human, often quite scruffy, sort of down at ground level, everyday enterprise. So we wanted to represent more of the latter because it's truer and it's more engaging for students and it prepares them better for the working life. Um, we wanted to address the black and minority ethnic attainment gap, so nationally around 15 point gap between the attainment of BAME and white students. Uh, and we had a significant proportion of BAME students in the law school in which I worked at. Uh, and probably most significantly engagement across the sector. There were problems, increasing problems, even before we reached uh, the, the, the COVID crisis in relation to attendance and engagement. And there's a host of possible reasons for that. More commuting students, more students doing part-time work, maybe the availability of recorded materials, um, but also distractions of students who are physically present, um, but aren't, um, don't have a kind of a learning presence in the classroom because of digital distractions. We felt that this was contributing to a sense of isolation, which is one factor. 
of the mental health crisis in our education. The students were doing okay, but they were increasingly kind of alienated from the studies. So we did a kind of a full on design project. So, uh, you know, we did visualization and prototyping and ideation, et cetera. But I'm just gonna highlight three techniques that we used as part of that. Um, so the first of them is user research. Um, you know, the heart of service design is designing for the user and often with the user. The, an initial question is, you know, what did we know about our students and what else did we want to know about our students to be able to fulfill this design brief effectively? And that brief for us was to reimagine year one of a general law degree to make it more connected and more real and more inclusive and more engaging. Um, the starting point is, is tacit knowledge. I was a bit wary of assumed knowledge in this field, but it was reassuring to read in, in, in the key text that you can use your existing knowledge base and you should do. In the project team of six, we had over a hundred years of ex experience of not just teaching, but providing pastoral care to these cohorts of students. We had to keep an open mind and, um, and question what we, what we thought we knew about the lived experience of our students. There's all sorts of data now in our education, as I'm sure you know, you know, from module evaluations, attainment and attendance data, national student survey, down to really detailed data that we're getting through now on you know, how long our students are spending on the virtual learning environment and they can get recorded lectures. And it's necessary to know this stuff, but often that data is intended for a different purpose. It's really about ranking and uh, audits and overview. Uh, and often it doesn't get under the skin of the lived experience of students. So we need to supplement that by, by desk research, which is really just looking at existing studies, not reinventing the wheel. So we looked at uh, studies from the Higher Education Academy on engagement, uh, work out of Leeds Law School in relation to student resilience. Uh, and some of my colleagues as part of the project team have been doing work on engagement and the, and the attainment gap. So again, this was useful, but again, the key thing about service design is that it's every organization is unique and you need to design your, your solutions to challenges around the, the particular needs of your users. So to supplement that, in particular, we used uh, user experience interviews. We didn't do them ourselves because of the power dynamic. We were gonna be asking students quite, quite personal questions um, and we thought that the power dynamic would, would stop students being open and honest with them. So we hired a third year undergraduate to do those interviews for us. Um, and there were questions really around things that we didn't feel that we knew, like the first contact with law, the first contact with the law school, those initial touch points, of course, are crucial in service design. We asked about relationships. There are friendships with other students, their trust, uh, their trust relationships with the staff the relationship of their studies to other parts of their lives, what their families thought about them being a law student, what they told their friends and their family about what they'd learned over the first year of their law degree. So in fact, the effective emotional parts of their relationship with being um, a law student, that gave us a lot of insight. For example, for students from really from quite deprived backgrounds, it wasn't so much that their families weren't supportive of them being in higher education, it went beyond that. The, the, some of them told us that their families were um, obstructive, um, that, they, that they obstructed them coming into university and taking part in their studies. Um, it's kind of something we, we knew at some level, but, uh, but to see it in black and white on the interview transcripts was, was, was really useful. Um, we also used focus groups, so a more, more ongoing uh, relationship with a small group of students to explore a particular issue. And we did that in relation to black and minority ethnic students. Um, and the big lesson to come out of though was that our, our South Asian students said, you, your perception of student life is derived from your own experience and from your whiteness. And you, we don't think that you understand uh, the reality of us being commuting students from Lancashire coming into doing it. When we go home, we have less privacy you have far more family commitments in relation to siblings and grandparents. Um, and that impacts on our ability to study at home, but also the, the sort of rather wild sense of freedom that we uh, have when we are on, on, on campus. So 
both of those were extremely useful techniques for doing that first stage of uh, service design, which is, which is greater empathy and greater understanding of the, of the user. Um, similarly, we used user personas. So user personas, uh, as Cooper says here, uh, were developed in the 1980s in uh, software design. They're not real people, uh, but they do <coughs> represent them in the design process, archetypes of actual users. Um, so how do we do them? I, I did a first draft, so I created these three personas to represent around about 180 first year undergraduate students. Um, and you add in demographic diversity in relation to education, and race, and age, social background, motivations, interests. Uh, but then it's important to review them with the team, but also review them with students and say, do you recognize these people? Do they appear to you to be, uh, to be authentic uh, archetypes of first year law students within our uh, law school? How did we use them? Well, first of all, they became really real to us very, very quickly because they've got a name and a face and a realistic backstory. Um, we became quite emotionally invested in them. We kept them really visible in the design process. So we, we met weekly and we always had the user personas in the middle of the table when we were discussing how we were going to organize the timetable and uh, learning and the gaps between classes. And we constantly questioned whether what we were uh, designing educationally was going to work for Terry and Nazir and, and Karen. Just briefly, I think there are the three other benefits. So they do help us to shift perspective from the teacher view to a student view. Um, secondly, they provide diversity beyond these demographic characteristics of having a uh, South Asian heritage student and a mature student and a student with caring responsibilities. In particular, the, the further diversity is around but law teachers tended to have been good law students. You know, they turned up, they liked the subject, they finished towards the top of their class. Uh, and that's not a universal experience. And using these personas can help us kind of shift our, our understanding of the law program from our own perspective and what we experienced uh, to perhaps a more challenging and difficult perspective. And thirdly, they act as what are called boundary objects. When I say the words, our first year students, it's not just a string of words, it immediately, um, you know, automatically calls up in my mind um, a set of images and assumptions and experiences. If I say that phrase in our group team with five of the people, our first year students, then the real danger is we've got five different versions of um, those assumptions and images and experiences that are popping up in, in, in people's minds. And if we just proceed on that basis, then very often um, we end up talking at loggerheads. I've lost count of the number of times I've been in uh, school meetings where we have disagreements that really just flow from the fact that we, we have different understandings of the same terminology. So by getting things out of our head, and this is a real design virtue, by getting things out of our head, it's the same with prototyping, and down on paper or in some visible representation, it really does promote a shared uh, understanding. The final tool, just to give you a quick uh, example of, is Service Safari. So again, this is a well-known tool in service design. You get the researcher to go through the same process as the user. So it could be something like opening a bank account or returning goods or applying for a passport. But you go through exactly the same process as your users are going to go through. So we did something along those lines. We might also call it an observational study or applied it, uh, ethnography even. Now in our education, of course, we do quite a lot of uh, teaching observation, uh, not as much as in further education in schools. Um, but it's a very different thing. On a teaching observation, I'll go to my colleague's office, knock on the door, we'll walk into the classroom together, I'll sit at the side of the class, I'll observe the teacher, I'll maybe give them some feedback at the end of the class and then go back to work. Now that's not the student experience of that, of that, that day in higher education. So um, I used it after I left UCLan and started at Lancaster last year to help me get a feel for the differences and similarities in student experience in my new institution. Um, and my colleague back at Preston used it to try to test uh, and understand 
whether our curriculum worked um, uh, so that we could improve it for the, the next round. How do you do it? Uh, aim for a whole day experience. So what I did, I found a volunteer. I met them at breakfast at the halls of residence, traveled into campus with them. Whatever they went, I went. When they went into a class, I went into that class, not to observe, but to sit amongst the students uh, and try to take notes and follow what the lecturer was saying as though I was a student. When they went to the library between classes, I went with them. When they went for a coffee with their friends, I went with them. And I planned to go through to around about eight o'clock in relation to this, but by about half past five, I felt so sorry for the student who had been trailing around uh, all day uh, that we called it. Uh, we, uh, we, we finished. It's important not to do this with a fixed agenda to, sort of test, to test a particular idea. So you've got to have your mind and your senses open and just observe. Um, I took notes throughout the day, but I also uh, took quick notes uh, on my uh, phone. What's the benefit of it as a service design tool? Again, it really helps in relation to shifting perspective. Observing classes isn't a student experience. You know, going to class and concentrating on the content and worrying where this is going and how we're going to be assessed on this and waiting around between classes and trying to find somewhere quiet to do some work and thinking about going to do a part-time job um, in a boy that evening. Think of, that's the experience. And these service safaris really help you get under the skin. Um, it did give me insight. Um, so it allowed me to see the nature of the new cohorts of students I was working with. Um, and you're not silently shadowing this person. You, you will be talking with them as you spend uh, time with them and their friends over the course of the day. And you do hear stories uh, that you probably wouldn't hear if they came to see you in your office. Um, and finally, about making connections. So when I went to Lancaster, I said, this is my role. I'm student experience lead. Uh, I'm interested in doing your experience. And I've got a lot of sort of polite nods of Lancaster's. But during and after the service of Fori, I got a very, very different reaction. It, the reaction was, you know, this guy means it. When he's talking about empathy, you know, this guy really means it. Um, and they said, no one's done this before. No one's taken the time to try to see things from our perspective before. So in terms of getting sort of credibility with the students um, as to the seriousness of uh, supporting them and understanding them, uh, it, was, it was really, really powerful. I'll just finish very quickly. Uh, on next steps, if, if any of this stuff uh, grabs you, I think there are probably kind of three things to do. One is, um, I think, you know, service design is really practical, but I think the starting point is getting your head around the conceptual model of design thinking. We use this, which is the uh, Stanford model of uh, design thinking. We could equally have used the uh, UK Design Council, Double Diamond. It's helpful because it provides a framework, it lets you know where you're going. Otherwise, the tools can appear to be some of it sort of random and dissociated. Uh, the second thing is uh, to learn the tools and methods of service design. Uh, and this was but my absolute Bible over the last two and a half years. So this is service design doing. It's a practical toolkit. It's covered by Adam Lawrence, who's very much involved in this particular jam. Um, and it gives you a really practical set of tools that you can pick up and start using in your own practice. And uh, the, I've written a bit about uh, design culture and legal culture recently. Um, but the big kind of cultural trope about uh, design is uh, you learn by doing, uh, you create your uh, scrappy first draft, you, you just do it. So I would just take, I would, I would just find that service design doing, um, Browse through it, take one or two of the tools there and just start using it in your own practice and learn, and learn from them.